So we transition from the environmental side of the so-called modern era to the economic side. And the phrase globalization is usually reserved for the acceleration of international economic transactions that occurred in the second half of the 20th century and does continue to this day. Now this is often viewed as a natural process, but it's really a stark contrast to the first half of the 20th century when the aftermath of World War I and the Great Depression resulted in a deep contraction of economic connections, and the global economy suffered greatly. International trade, investment, and labor migration tailed off as states focused inward on high tariffs and economic self-sufficiency. Global economic transactions quickened dramatically after World War II, partially because the capitalist winners were determined to avoid another Great Depression. Hence the solutions that we've seen were proposed at the Bretton Woods Conference, namely the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. New technology also contributed to economic globalization. Large shipping containers, oil tankers, and express air service lowered transportation costs, while fiber optic cables and eventually the internet provided the infrastructure necessary for expanding economic globalization. The new globalization that started in the 1970s and continues to the present is known as neoliberalism and involved major capitalist countries like the US and Great Britain abandoning political controls on the economy and really viewing the world as a single marketplace. This approach involved methods like reducing tariffs, privatizing state-run enterprises, tax and spending cuts, and a mobile and temporary workforce. These ideas were given further justification when state-run command economies really began to collapse around the world. Now, world trade skyrocketed during this time. World trade stood at about $57 billion in 1947. It was over $18.3 trillion in 2012. Most supermarkets and department stores stock their shelves with goods from around the world. You know, for example, by 2005, around 70% of all Walmart products had components from China. An Australian-based Kiwi shoe polish was sold in 180 countries. Toyota replaced General Motors as the world's largest automaker and had plants in at least 18 different countries. Money also became highly mobile in a global sense, and there's three ways this was cheap. The first was direct uh, foreign direct investment, which is when a firm in one company opens up a factory in China. You know, this exploded after 1960. Companies in wealthy nations like the United States sought to take advantage of cheap labor, tax breaks, and loose environmental regulations. The second factor is short-term investment in capital, meaning investors spend money purchasing foreign currencies or stocks and sell them quickly after they increase in value. And the third would be international credit cards involving the personal funds of individuals. And this allows easy transfer of money to other countries and across national borders. The example you see on screen, MasterCard. You know, in 2012, MasterCard was accepted at 33 million businesses in a total of 220 countries or territories. So the way we conduct business is altering. And central to the process of economic globalization are transnational corporations, or TNCs. And these are huge global businesses that operate in many countries simultaneously. For one example, Mattel produced the popular Barbie doll. They used molds from the United States, plastic and hair from Taiwan and Japan, cotton cloth from China, and the factories were located in Indonesia, Malaysia, and China. And more than 1 billion were sold in 150 countries in 1999 from distribution centers in Hong Kong. Now, gaining in economic clout since the 1960s, some TNCs like Royal Dutch Shell, Sony, and 
and General Motors, those are just three examples, they have greater economic clout than many countries. By the year 2000, 51 of the world's 100 largest economic units were TNCs, not actual countries. With fewer economic restrictions worldwide, companies have been able to quickly move from place to place to take advantage of the cheapest labor costs and lowest environmental regulations. Nike alone closed 25 factories and opened 35 others in a five-year period of time. Large numbers of workers, both laborers and professionals, have moved all over the world from poor countries to richer ones. Millions more people have sought refuge in the West from oppression or civil war at home. Others migrate from developing to industrialized countries known as labor migrants. Now, more often than not, these migrants have few skills, but they wish to escape poverty and they do possess an awareness that a better future awaits them in developed countries. About 4 million Filipino domestic workers were employed in 130 countries by 2003. But hundreds of thousands of young women were recruited in wealthier nations for illicit activities. Small numbers of skilled workers like doctors and computer scientists pursued opportunities not available in their home countries. And this represented a reverse development from poor to rich companies, or poor to rich countries. Over one million Chinese migrated to Africa since 2000. 200 or 20 million to the United States alone between 1971 and 2010. And many of these immigrants were from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia. Economic globalization accompanied and even helped generate the greatest economic growth spurt in world history. And this led to the immense creation of wealth. Total output grew from seven trillion in 1950 to 73 trillion in 2009. Life expectancies rose nearly everywhere. Infant mortality declined, literacy rates increased, and there was a great decline in poverty. The UN reported that in the past 50 years, poverty has fallen more than in the previous 500. Now, the new world economy has experienced a series of crises. More recently in 2008, but also coming in early 2020. Oil prices led to a stock market crash in 1973 and 1974. The inability to pay off debts led to a huge financial crisis in Latin America and a financial crisis in Asia during the late 1990s led to massive unemployment in Indonesia and Thailand. One of the more recent crises was in 2008 when the housing bubble burst in the US. This caused unemployment, it caused millions of foreclosures, the tightening up of credit, and a decline in consumer spending. This really reverberated around the world. Iceland's economy collapsed as three major banks failed. Uh, reduced demand for African exports halted a decade of economic progress. Crises occurred in Greece, Italy, and Spain, and the list goes on and on. A massive chasm has developed between rich industrialized countries and everywhere else. The ratio between the income of the top and bottom 20% of the world's population was 3 to 1 in 1820. It was 86 to 1 as of 1991. And this great disparity has shaped almost everyone's life chances. So, as is often the case when you pursue capitalism or capitalist elements in your economy, there's great wealth to be had, but there's also subsequently going to be lack of opportunity for others.